Carrasquillo is a principal investigator <laughs> at the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Okay. Um, so uh, before we begin with your questions, um, can each of you tell the audience just a little bit about your, your work? Okay. Um, we can start here on okay. the left. So again, I'm Sedona Jackson. I am a pediatric neuro-oncologist. Um, I've been at the NIH now for almost five years, so four and a half years. Uh, I have a laboratory research effort um, where I have a team that works in the lab, and our main focus is on the blood-brain barrier. Blood-brain barrier is a, a collection of cells that helps to really prevent good things and bad things from getting into the brain. And so as a brain tumor doctor for children, the blood-brain barrier um, really prevents some of the chemotherapy and some of the agents that we want to get across to kill those ugly brain tumor cells. So my research uh, group in the lab works on how can we open up for a short period of time that blood-brain barrier to allow more drugs to get there. Um, and then my clinical effort in me seeing patients is to be able to use some of the agents, to be able to use some of the research findings that we find in the lab and, and look at drug delivery, look at um, in, um, the best type of treatments for these aggressive type of brain tumors in children and in some adults. So I've been here at the NIH for about four and a half years and uh, I love science. I've loved science from a very young age. I was born and raised in Gaithersburg, Maryland, which is about 20 minutes from the National Institutes of Health. Interesting enough, I did laboratory research as a high school student when I went to Gaithersburg High School. Shout out to Gaithersburg High School. Um, and I traveled like half a day in high school to come here. So NIH has been a part of my life for a very long time, even though I'm so young. Um, <laughs> but um, that's just a little bit of background about me, my love of science, my introduction of science at an early age, and then why I'm here today um, to talk about mentoring. So. All right. Well, my name is Yarimar Carrasquillo. I, um, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Um, that's where I did my undergraduate um, degree and where I was introduced to science uh, uh, doing neuroscience research. So here at the NIH, I'm a neuroscientist, principal investigator. Like Dr. Jackson, I have also my, my independent lab. And my group is interested in understanding the mechanisms that drive bidirectional and modulation of pain in the brain. And what that basically means is that we can all empathize with the idea that we know that pain is not static, that depending on different conditions, if you're stressed or if you have a lot of attention to, to the particular stimulus, you can feel pain differently. You can have enhancement of pain or decreases in pain. So what my lab is interested in is how is the brain mediating that um, like rheostat of, of turning pain up and down. And we have focused on this brain structure that is called the amygdala, and it's important for affective or, or emotional behaviors. And what we have demonstrated is that it functions, it has two different cell types um, of different flavors, I say. Um, this is all in, in, in rodent models of, of, of pain. So what we look at is at the circuit level and also at the cellular level. So at the cellular level, we, we've identified two different flavors, um, if you may, um, of genetically distinct cells. And these cells, one population of cells increases pain and the other one decreases pain. So what we're trying to identify now is what are the mechanisms that are driving this, um, both from the circuit level, so which, which brain areas is these, are these cells talking to, and also at the cellular level, zooming in and looking at, at all the, the electrophysiology stuff that I, that I particularly love. Um, that's at the, at the scientific level. I, uh, I care a lot about mentoring. That's why we're all here and increasing um, diversity. So I, I do a lot of, of, of that on the side as well. And, um, and uh, just, just doing good science, basically. So that's what we do in the lab. Um, well, uh, my name is Shereen Ol Toki, and I was uh, born and raised in um, Egypt, um, Cairo. Um, so I think I loved science uh, just growing up in a household where, you know, my parents are both uh, university professors. So 
Um, you know, I would just, you know, around the, the dinner table, you would hear about research and dissertations and, you know, committees. And, and so I just, I just think it became kind of natural to me. I remember even, you know, as early as, um, you know, middle school writing research papers and kind of winning <laughs> awards. Um, you know, in, in, as an undergraduate, I was really fortunate to have amazing mentors who put me on, on a path that, you know, um, allowed me to discover research. So I was doing research before kind of putting a name to it, like actually knowing that this is um, like scientific research. Um, so I got my undergraduate and a master's degree um, from Cairo University in Egypt. And then I, uh, I was on track to finish my PhD when I got this um, uh, scholarship to come to the US. And, and so that's where I ended up um, coming and getting my doctorate from University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill. So I'm a Tar Heel. Um, and then I um, joined NIH as a postdoc in 2014. Uh, I've stayed as a postdoc for about uh, four years and then I transitioned into uh, a PI um, a position at the National Institute on Minority Health. I've been um, as a, you know, I've claimed the position of a PI for about a little over a year now. So I have my independent research group. And, um, you know, unlike, um, you know, everybody here on the panel, I really do social behavioral uh, research. Uh, so our team is interested in developing behavioral interventions that can drastically reduce death and illness from behaviors that we can all change. So think about, you know, tobacco use, for example. If we can get people to quit, we can reduce the death and illness from um, such behavior. Um, so this is what I am uh, doing, and, and, you know, I'm passionate about mentoring as well. And Sadana and I are both part of the Distinguished Scholars Program, which is um, a program at NIH to promote um, diversity and Partly that's the reason why we're here today. <laughs> Excellent. And now that you know a little bit about uh, the panelists, I'd like to get started with some of your questions. If you're just, just tuning in, uh, I'm Dr. Melissa Gim of the Office of Research on Women's Health, and we're here with uh, Dr. Sadana Jackson, uh, Shireen el okay. and Yamar Karsk. Karskio. Yes. <laughs> um, and they'll be answering your questions about mentorship in biomedical and STEM careers. Okay, I think we have um, a, so just to start off the conversation, um, I think this is coming in from um, a, a viewer. What makes a good mentor? Like, who'd like to take that question? Because all of you have <laughs> had mentors. And so we should start with good things. Yes. Good things. <laughs> so <laughs> what makes a good mentor? I think a good listener, somebody who is well connected, and somebody who, when you come to them, uh, thinks about, okay, how can I help this person advance in their career? Yep. So it's not a, what can I get from this person? Yep. I remember sometime during my um, hematology oncology fellowship, one of the one of my instructors attending, she said, "You know, you're going to find mentors, but also know, and I I disagree with this, that any mentor that you're going to come across or somebody that you, they're going to want to get something from you." And I think that that's true in a way, but I don't think that that's the right mentality for a mentor to have if they think, okay, this person's going to come to me and needs their help, needs my help or assistance. What can I get from them? You know, so I think a good mentor is somebody who says, how can I advance this person's career? Because I know long term it's going to look good for me. So <laughs> that that can be the the gain, but not just like what I can get. From. So I think if anything, I would say, good listener. How, somebody who's well connected and somebody who is thinking forward how they can help you in, in prospering and being successful. Um, I think I think for me, um, a good mentor is somebody who is generous with their time. Time is the most kind of valuable kind of commodity mm -hmm. that we have. So if they're willing to um, give time, then they are really they really care about you. And then they open doors. They really put you on a path uh, to kind of, um, um, kind of uh, make your own potential and reach your potential. So those have been like the most um, kind of important characteristics of, of good mentors that I have had in my life. They give me time and they open doors, a lot of doors. I agree with both. <laughs> what I would add to that is that 
I think it is important two things. One is to provide individualized training so that you cannot, uh, so, so that each member of the lab gets treated depending on what their specific needs mm -hmm. are. So I think that, that I benefited a lot, a lot from that because sometimes you might come with certain strengths, but you might have some weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And if the expectations are the same for everyone in the lab, then it's not tailored to what you want. Mm -hmm. So like when I was looking for, for labs, both at my graduate level and my uh, postdoc level, that's what I wanted to know is how is this person, like what, how flexible is this person in terms of, of their mentoring style? and adjusting them to my specific needs and what I want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Then the second one, which I think it's, it's even more important to me. Um, so I did my undergrad in Puerto Rico. We speak Spanish and the culture is Latin culture. Then I come here uh, for grad school to a higher level education and also a different language and a different culture. Mm -hmm. And what was particularly important to me that made a huge difference was that my graduate mentor, he really cared about learning about my culture mm -hmm. and providing, you know, we hear a lot about inclusive environment, yeah. but what that means is that you have to get to know your people so that you provide a truly inclusive environment where people feel comfortable mm -hmm. and not just as a foreign person that doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. So I think that that to me is the single most important thing that if you can find a place where you where you don't feel like a stranger or like a, 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 a foreign, you know, even if you are a foreign, <laughs> like you want to belong to that group. And I think that that, that sense of belonging really, it's, uh, it's very powerful. So I think that I try to do that with the people in my lab, but that made a huge difference when I was transitioning um, here. I agree. Yes, excellent. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, so we have another question um, so, uh, from uh, our viewers. So what is your favorite part of being a mentor? And this is something that all three of you could speak to, but why don't we start with a different order? We can start with <laughs> the one with the water in the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> So this, this will be counterintuitive to, to what Jackson said, but I, 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 I still agree that we should okay. not, we shouldn't get, but just the honest answer is I'm a data junkie. Okay. So <laughs> as a mentor, I get to have- uh, disagree, it's okay. Not, no, 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 I, I still agree that you shouldn't, you shouldn't hire people or you shouldn't be a mentor trying to get something out of them. But the truth is that when you get five times more data than what you used to have when you were a postdoc. It's just a wonderful thing to do. <laughs> but at the same time, seeing the progress, you know, that you see in your students or in your trainees from the beginning when they join the lab to when they leave, the person that they become, that to me, it's extremely rewarding. It doesn't matter, you know, you can have people that come in as a rock star and you help them become a little bit better, and that's rewarding. But the ones that come from a little bit behind, and you can see this ginormous progress, that to me is it's just a, a, a great feeling. So that's what I like the most. Um, I mean, for, for me, I mean, you know, think of think of uh, the mentor-mentee relationship as a family. Like, you know, in, in my graduate program at UNC, we used to call, um, Jane, who is my academic advisor, you know, my academic mom, right? And all of her mentees were like, we were academic siblings. So it's like kind of a family. And I like that, you know, I have had people who help me tremendously. And so mentoring somebody is just my way of paying it forward and, and just passing along some of the good advice and support and experiences that I have had myself or you know my mentors had shared with me. And if you see that helping somebody, that is very rewarding yeah. for me. I agree with that, the paying it forward. Yeah. And I enjoy seeing the light bulb that comes yep. on um, when you're teaching something and when they finally have gotten it yep. 
and they have started to apply what you taught yeah. them. So that's kind of the paying it forward. But when that light bulb comes, it's like, oh, yeah. I did something. They got it. They're taking initiative. <laughs> or they've thought past the one question that I had. They have like a subpart to that. So it's just, just generation of great ideas and thoughts and additional questions because of what is our good mentoring yeah, yeah, yeah. is what brings smile to my face. Okay, and here's another question from our, our viewers. How do you help your mentees to stay positive in the face of rejections and obstacles? Um, why don't we start with... Okay, so, I mean, we are in academia, and, you know, rejections is just part of the game. I mean, everything that we do is about feedback. I mean... Uh, think about submitting a paper for publication. You're submitting it for to be peer reviewed, and so you get feedback. Some of it is positive, some of it is you know not so positive. Think about submitting a grant. It's all about getting that peer feedback. One of my mentors, um, you know, she said, "Learn to have a thick skin and short memory. Not about what you the good things that you need to learn, but just just don't get hung up on." You know, oh my God, the paper got rejected. This is part of the process. You know, and the feedback, you know, you get from, you know, the peer review. We might not like it at the beginning, but every uh, feedback that I have gotten have always improved the final product. So if you think about it from that perspective, uh, feedback is good. Uh, we all like to get praise and, you know, good feedback but also constructive feedback is, is really good because that's how we improve. If all the feedback that I'm getting is like, oh, you're doing a great job, then there is no room for me to grow. So we have to learn how to give but also receive feedback. So rejection is part of the game, and if you get discouraged by just the paper getting rejected, well, we're never gonna publish anything. So you just have to keep at it keep improving and keep, keep uh, trying and eventually it turns out, you know, for the best. Mm -hmm. And I think um, for me, I um, remind myself and my mentees that uh, history has a good role in showing success. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this is not the first time you're, you've gotten rejected. You were rejected mm -hmm. three years ago, not about a paper, but something else that you really, really, really thought you wanted mm -hmm. and you didn't get it. But look at you now. Yep. You're mm -hmm. in a lab. You are doing work. You're mm -hmm. generating questions. You're generating answers. And so this one rejection, yes, it's bad. Let's go get some ice cream. Let's go get a coffee. Let's go do something else. But just know that this is just one small piece of your life. Mm -hmm. Big right this second, right this moment. But a month from now, it'll be something else. Two months from now, it'll be something else. So just think about it in the scheme of mm -hmm. life keeps going. Yeah. And, and yes, uh, it is bad but know that it's not going to be for forever. So. Yeah, I would agree. The, the one thing I would add is I try to always keep something good. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's always something good in life. Mm -hmm. So in the lab specifically, sometimes experiments are not working. So if you can find what I call the low-hanging fruits, you mm -hmm. know, just something that you can do, work on the methods of the paper mm -hmm. if your experiments aren't working that well, or just something that you can tangibly see that there's progress so that you don't fall in that negative loop of, oh, things are bad, so I'm not gonna get anything done. And then you just yep. keep circling in this very bad place. So I think that, that, that that's one of the, of the things and, and you know, just keeping an eye on the price. Yep. You know, the, the how you get there doesn't matter. Right. If, you, yep. if you have, you know, it's not just the academic obstacles, there's a lot of life that always happens, and we have to be sensitive about that as well. And I think that I had to learn, <laughs> I, I was not too flexible with my life and my plans, you know, it had to be the way I wanted it. And at some point, you know, life hits you, and, and my reaction to that was, I'm out. And then I, I had good mentors that mm -hmm. told me, when you're upset, you don't Make Quit. decisions. You wait. You have to wait 24 <laughs> hours. Yeah. Yeah. I needed a little bit more than 24 <laughs> hours in that situation, but she told me this was my postdoc mentor, Jean Nervon, and she told me, "Don't make decisions now. Wait until things get better. And then, if you still want to not pursue academia, then that's fine." And that was probably the best advice I've ever gotten, hmm. because. At the time, I think it's not a good time to make decisions, mm -hmm. whether it is a paper 
or something in life, illness, you know, you never know. So I think that just being flexible and knowing that you can get there even if it wasn't the perfect plan you had in your head. Mm -hmm. And extremely important to surround yourself with positive people that yes. love you, that care about you, that, you know, I call them my cheerleaders. I've, I've built a lot of people in my life, uh, in, my, in my academic family, mm -hmm. that are just there for me. Even when I feel like everything sucks, I they're there. And I think that when you surround yourself with those people, they are the ones that will keep pushing you up. So I think that, that those are the, the things that are important for me. Mm -hmm. So are there, another question from the viewers, are there responsibilities of a mentee? Um, how should a mentee let a mentor know that it's not working? I think that there are big responsibilities yeah. of the mentee. So you come to these meetings or you have either impromptu or scheduled and the mentee should come with items that need to be discussed, things that they're interested in, things that they think are a good idea or a bad idea, and so they, I feel like the mentee needs to be the one that already has a structured um, idea of what should be included in the mentee meeting, if it's a, a meeting. And then what do they want to get out of this mentee mentorship relationship? Do they want to get connected with, I'll say, in the pediatric neuro-oncology space? Do they want to um, uh, do a certain type of research and they need you to introduce them to that cohort of, uh, of people? So I think the mentee has a large role. The mentor has a lar large role too, but I think the mentee has to take ownership of how successful do you do I want this relationship to be? Um, and just communication, 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 communication. And it, I, I will sometimes joke and say I'm super aggressive. And so my team and I have said that it's not aggressiveness, it's assertiveness. And <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes as females, if we're aggressive, then yep. it comes with another kind of expletive term to how we get mm -hmm. labeled. Um, but it takes for a mentee, especially especially a woman, to be assertive in making sure that the goals are uh, fulfilled in the relationship between a mentee and a mentor. So, And how important is it to establish this formal relationship um, sort of ground rules prior to selecting a mentor? Is this a conversation that can happen? You know, is this should this be a conversation that happens before when you're in the selection process? Well, in the yeah. interview, yeah. I think it's yeah. really important to discuss mentoring. your working styles, your mentoring style. I, I think that a lot of it has to do with the fit of different styles, and you know, some people will want to have more freedom. Some people want to yeah, just on. be more, and and you have to make sure that you have a good fit with your mentor. And I think that the interview is the time not just with the PI, but I think it is important to talk with the people in the lab so that you know, because you know, we might have a, a vision of how we are, <laughs> and it might be a little different than the vision that our, men, that, that our trainees have. So I think it is important to have one-on-one -on -one individual meetings with the trainees without the mentor so that they can share with them what is it to be like to work in that lab, and then you can decide whether that's what you want or not. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And a question from the viewers. Uh, microaggressions can be very overwhelming. What are good coping strategies for mentees who are racial or ethnic minorities in addition to women? So I'm going to ask the social behavior <laughs> behavioralist yeah. here about this one. Well, I agree 100% that they can be overwhelming. And um, I mean, I don't have the data to back it up, but I would assume that you know, women proportionally, disproportionately get you know, um, like more of these behaviors, and it can drain you. <laughs> um, so again, you know, my cheerleaders. I, you know, I think many of us have been in similar situations, and sometimes you feel that it's really hard to get to work and uh, because you just don't want to be in that environment but at the end of the day uh, you know the advice that I received from my 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 cheerleaders <laughs> is just you know 
keep focused on on the research don't lose uh, track of the you know take your eyes off that big prize yeah. and then again surround yourself with with positive people who are going to mitigate some of this like negative energy that can be um, in the lab and you know again depending on the circumstances sometimes you might be able to kind of uh, maybe talk to the PI maybe they're not aware of, of yeah. their behavior so make that a teaching moment if they're not you know responsive then you may, maybe you can take it you know a step further or sometimes you might be successful in just removing yourself and switching labs or you know something more drastic but at the end of the day my advice is don't let it kind of drag you down and let it affect your research because ultimately you want to you want to keep that going uh, because it will set you up for the next um, step I think communication is the key something that I have learned uh, again with time is that you know the common sense is the least common of the senses that's what I always say and what might be completely intuitive to me might not be for, might not be for someone else mm -hmm. so with time I've learned that I give everyone the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. so if something is happening I try to communicate it to that person so that we give them the without being upset just telling them how this feels or why this isn't you know working out the if the if the macro if the microaggressions are not by the PI and it, they are within the lab, then definitely I, I, I encourage trainees, at least in my lab, I tell them I want a positive lab environment is really important to me. So if there's something going on, tell me. please let me know. If the problem is with the mentor, then I think that trying to find other mentors, you know, so so when I talk about my cheerleaders, I, I, I had not only my, my wonderful uh, principal investigators in my lab, I had just this big network of people that really cared and respected me. So I would go to them and they would help me navigate. Just getting a different perspective is sometimes useful. Could be misunderstanding sometimes. Yes. Yes. So Dr. Jackson, can you also speak to the importance of having multiple men mentors? Yes. So. Um, don't you say something about dating and who? who <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so my, my analogy. Yeah, my <laughs> my analogy is like it's like dating. Right, right. So <laughs> finding a, to build finding a good <laughs> yeah finding a good mentor is like dating around to try to figure out who would be the best uh, partner for you. And it's okay. I guess it's like polyamorous. It's okay. <laughs> mentors because they are feeding you with different types of benefits yeah. of being a mentee. So I have um, had awesome mentors in my time. I've had some not so awesome mentors and I was able to recognize that I the not so awesome ones because I had had awesome ones before. Yeah. But what made the awesome ones awesome was because they listened, because they were willing to introduce me to their network and to and to that network then introduced me to others. Um, when I went to meetings, they said, oh, this person is somewhat in your field. You may want to talk to them, or you should go talk to them. Or they sent emails to be able to correspond. So um, there was one thing that we did talk about off camera as well. Um, a mentor that I think is awesome for me may be awesome for me, but it may be horrible for, for Dr. Carrasquillo, yeah. or maybe horrible for Dr. El Tuque. So. It, just know that it, it is individualized, it's specific, it is to the type of person that you are, the type of thinker that you are, but it's absolutely important for you to have more than one mentor, yeah. regardless of what industry you're in and what you want to do long term. And I think, I think there's, there's a lot of different kinds. You should have peer mentors, yes. like, you know, if you're a grad student, Someone that has already submitted a proposal right. can help you mentor in that aspect. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you're writing a paper, a postdoc in the lab can help you. Then you might want to have, 
a junior investigator in the in the department that can help you. You know, they just went through the job market thing, right. so they can help you with that. But then you want to have the super senior people that are very well connected and will, you know, send the email if Absolutely. needed. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I think having these different layers, you know, you, you as, as females, we definitely need to have female role models that can help you navigate the whole like family life and work uh, integration integration yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so so I think that 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 we just need to have all these different aspects and you cannot find one person that will yeah. do all these different yeah. things yeah. so you need to have and even as female sorry to pose on yeah. I think sometimes we think we have to have a female mentor yeah. because yeah. she will understand our um, yeah, interests because she has the same a level of uh, estrogen and testosterone and progesterone <laughs> but no like some of my best mentors have been male yeah. and they haven't been men of color they've been <laughs> white males yeah, and it just too. happened <laughs> to be that they understood me and were able to help me along so um, taking the time to get to know you so yes. that they can help you yeah. yes 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 so if you're just joining us um, thank you for tuning in to this live a Q&A um, I'm Dr. Melissa Gim of uh, the Office of Research on Women's Health um, here with uh, Dr. Sadana Jackson, uh, Shireen el and uh, Yarmar Kaskio. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're here to answer any questions about <laughs> mentoring. <laughs> um, so here, another question from the viewer. What role would you say that culture plays in mentoring? So we haven't heard from Dr. el in a little while, so would you like to take this one? Well, I, I think going back to um, what Dr. Kurskaya had said earlier is that we come from different backgrounds and so it's, it's really important to understand somebody's background. I think when I first came to the U.S., I used to go and knock on doors because I like face-to-face -face interaction and, you know, sometimes people would tell me, oh, just send me an email. So you have to kind of um, adjust um, kind of your way of, of, of dealing with um, things, including mentoring, depending on um, the cultural background. Uh, I always... And did, sorry, did you knock on people's door and go visit them because that's what you had done in Cairo? Yes, I, we lo we, I mean, it's, it's I mean, prioritized like face-to-face -face communication and, you know, in-person kind of meetings and, you know, just when coming here, it was like, no, it's like, you know, sending... <laughs> Make you an know, appointment. <laughs> very brief emails, and you know, and it, and it yeah. was it was fine. It was just it, you know. I just had to transition. One of the other things that you know, I grew up like you never brag about what you do. Like you let the work speak for itself, and even when you've done something really awesome, oh, it was like you know because of you know people who supported me, which is true. But I also learned that you no, know, sometimes you have to really kind of. Um, you know, put the spotlight on you. And so, you know, I, maybe because I come from a different cultural background, I recognize that a little bit. And so I, I tell fellows in my lab, you know, don't f ever feel that you're not good enough. You're here because you're so good. And don't, um, you know, be afraid of taking credit for what you have done because you often see this like, well, it's not so good. Like oh, they good, present yeah. something to you, and they're kind of like, "Well, it's not really polished." I was like, "It's okay," you know, because I think they don't want to like really take credit for the awesome work that they have done. Mm -hmm. And so I think in in a mentor mentee relationship, we just have to recognize some of the cultural background and how that kind of affects how we present our work and ourselves. And you know, then you might be able to help somebody really put their best foot forward um, in a job application or interview or so forth. These, I, I have noticed a lot. We, we have a, even though we're super outspoken socially, <laughs> in science we, we tend to be a yep. little bit more uh, shy yep. and, and uh, not as confident. And I think that the other thing that I try to emphasize a lot to my trainee is, because I, I, I was fortunate enough to, to be in a comfortable environment to do it, is not only about your work, but you gotta take pride and feel confident about your expertise. 
So if you're at seminars and you have a question, Raise you know, hand. like people that grow up here, they just go and, you know, my <laughs> son is 12 and I'm sure he would just go and talk to whoever it is Nobel Prize and ask a question. <laughs> we are like, oh, no, no, what if my question is it's not good? good or yeah. Just go out there, put yourself out there and ask questions yeah. because that's how you get to communicate with that's people right. and other people are also doing the same thing. Yeah. And I think culturally, that's a big difference mm -hmm. that I see not only with the with the Hispanic population, just it's very different across the world. And especially when you have accents, mm -hmm. you're totally self-conscious. Oh, what if I don't say the right word? What if they don't understand me? Then you repeat yeah. <laughs> until they get it. Right. Yeah. So. And you're not the first or last person that they're going to come across that has an accent. Yep. Oh, that was wonderful. When I, when I started at Baylor, I was so self-conscious of my, of my accent. Then but you're in Texas. We, <laughs> yes, but even in science, you know, and, and it's just, it's these things that you have in your head, right? Yeah. And you're, I am in Texas, but I am at the Baylor College of Medicine. The population is not that high Got it. of people like me. But it was wonderful that we have this neuroscience seminar series and all these amazing people that I respected highly and had these labs and great research programs and they came in and I could understand them so <laughs> because of their accents. So it gave me a perspective that it's okay yep. to have accents and it's not, yep. it doesn't make you less. Yes. 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 And you also mentioned something um, earlier about the importance of having an inclusive environment. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that is directly related to the culture of, of a place. So can you speak a little bit about, you know, how to make a place, you know, as a, from the perspective of a men mentor now, how to make an environment more inclusive? I think, again, you need to get to know your people, right? So we've had groups in the lab that everyone likes to go dancing so we all go dancing mm -hmm. but then you know the lab changes and now we might have someone that not only doesn't like dancing but this person might not feel comfortable in a place that has alcohol yep. so then we stop doing that activity yep. because me as a mentor i don't want to be like well you stay behind <laughs> and we're going to go dancing and you're going to miss out so I think just just getting to know, and it's not that hard. I mean, one can see with the body language when they don't yep. feel comfortable doing something and just trying to provide the, um, activities that we all feel comfortable doing. But going back on the point of the responsibilities of a mentee, I mean, you also have to tell, communicate, communicate because I don't know every cultural background there is. So the, I mean, I would say just use, if there is a special holiday or a special event or something that you're not comfortable or comfortable doing, you know, take this as a teaching moment and tell me, well, I can't really do this because so and so. And of course, definitely we'll find another activity or, you know, you know, I'll understand why if you don't want to join or where you're coming from, but it has to go back to that two-way street, you know, you know, you have to communicate and tell me what's what's going on so that we can all create that inclusive environment. Communication is key, yeah. for real. Yeah. And I don't know what I don't know. I mean, you right. have to tell me. Right? And share what you feel comfortable. Sometimes there's a, a, a gray line, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like there's certain things that I'm like, no, 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 you don't have to tell me those things. It's fine. Like, sometimes it's okay to say my personal preference mm -hmm is to not participate in these things, right. can we find something else to do? You don't have to say why, and that's it's fine, yeah, like you know? Right. Uh, like, there's, there's, there's a boundary and that's perfectly fine, but I think it is important to let your peers know mm -hmm. and your mentors know that these are the things that, you know, that you like or you yes. don't like. Yes. Yes. Okay, another question from the viewers. Um, do you recommend support groups for faculty and researchers of color at their respective institutions? Um, the viewer says that she's noticed an increase in support groups for students of color, but not so much for faculty oh, or researchers of color. 
Well, That's an absolute yes. <laughs> That's so true. That's yes. an absolute yes. We were talking about yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. So we, are, um, Dr. El Tuki and I, are part of the Distinguished Scholars Program, mm -hmm. which started in 2017. Yeah. Yes. We and were the first it was cohort. yeah. We are we are part of the first, first cohort. cohort, and it really started as a way to um, bring in and to retain good um, uh, people of color in the sciences. Um, we're not all of color within no, the state. It's underrepresented. Program. Yeah, it's underrepresented. So, so this is just one cohort group that I am a part of that has uh, allowed me to continue to be a great mentor, be a good mentee, um, and to just teach me. And um, maybe I have kind of like this theme, but I have a different groups of yeah. peer mentors that are um, people of color and not people of color yeah. that I also help to feed me in being a good mentor and mentee. Yeah. So I think it's awesome to have that, and I think it's very essential to have that at whatever institution you're in, because yeah. there are going to be some things that Dr. Carrasquillo would only be able to understand as a woman of color yeah. that my white a woman of non-color would not understand the microaggressions, would not understand certain commentary, mm -hmm. would not understand different cultural aspects of of what I'm going through or have gone through. And so to try to have to like go back and have to uh, explain history, yeah. no. Like yeah. today is the first day that I ever met Dr. Carrasquillo. And we're friends already. And we're friends already. <laughs> and we started to talk about some of our um, ups and downs. Uh, and it just, it just, it was easy. It's easy to, it's very when you easy. have your So people. you have to have that peer mentorship group and you can have several mm -hmm. um, to really help to get you through. Um, and navigate I just think that the that's system. Essential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, part of why we don't have, you know, support groups is because, again, our numbers are so few, and, right. and yeah. that's that's part. And that's of why we this. always yeah. have to find yeah. each other. So that's <laughs> why you actually go out and seek people who will give you that support, even if there is no formal kind of uh, structure there to give support for uh, women of color as faculty or as researchers. You just seek them out. And life is a lot easier when you have people that you share a lot of things yeah. with. Sometimes, you know, we, we are fortunate here at the NIH, it's very big, so you can find these groups, but I could see how at smaller institutions it might be hard to find this network. And what I encourage you is, I mean, I always say this when I'm doing any outreach activities, I'm here, mm -hmm. <laughs> like just an email away. And there's a lot of people just like me that will also help you out, even if they don't know you. So, because they just, can remember when they were the only. Yeah, yeah. So you can you can reach out now with social media. is It's even easier to to reach out and say like, you know, I'm starting a lab. I am the first Latina in that whole place, and I feel completely out of place. You know, how can you? Like, can anyone help me? And, and I think just having, you know, now we have a, a, a bigger network that is not just virtual, in person. Virtual yeah. network. Yeah. Yes. yeah, and I say use I've it. I've had people to reach out to me, yeah. uh, Instagram and Twitter, and say, can I just have a phone conversation, yeah. or can we just meet for Skype. coffee? Yeah. I've done that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And I feel like I need to do that. Yeah. Yeah, Those people yeah. are going to be my bosses one day. Yeah. Like, why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, I, think, I think it is important because... And, and that took me a while to learn too, because you know, as scientists, we 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 we're so focused on getting whatever it is that we need to get done done, and we we're troubleshooters, so it's like yes, we're gonna get it done. But it's so much easier if you reach out to other people and they help you. So, fantastic. So uh, another question from our viewer for international mentees beyond accepting and being confident. With, uh, your mm -hmm. with your accent, with your accent, what suggestions would you make to improve writing skills in English and um, academic level? So, who'd like to take that one? I mean, okay. I mean, I I just practice makes perfect. I guess. I mean, looking at you know the first paper I wrote in graduate school, I had um, one of my awesome professors. Uh, she read it and she, um, in her email, she said, Shereen, just please be seated before you open the document because it was so red line. <laughs> and that is, that is perfectly fine. Now you see how 
my writing improved like tremendously and it's just because you keep at it you keep writing papers and then eventually you develop your own style I mean you can read one of my papers and you know exact my colleagues they will know which sections I wrote just because of how you know it's, um, uh, yeah. it, it's very revealing that this is this is my stuff so I would say don't be shy of having an accent it's okay to have an accent it means that you know more than one language uh, uh, which is which is awesome uh, as far as writing skills the more you read papers the more you write papers and read. Brands, read and write the more these skills will improve and just just give it time it will come it will come that's what, what I would say yes. I took advantage of every single workshop that was available I was so self-conscious about I think it was, I mean, my mentor told me I was exaggerating, but I was so self-conscious about how bad my English was. Clearly, it wasn't that bad because I got into grad <laughs> school and I did well in the courses, but to me, it was horrible. So I took advantage of every single workshop that was available at my institution until I felt like, okay, now I know all this, you know, it's fine. But I took them every single year, every time that, 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 that it was available, I would take it for presentations, for writing. When I went to meetings and they had workshops, I would go there. Like it's just, you just have to make the most out of the opportunities that are given to you. Um, and, and I could not emphasize more read. Yep. So a lot of people want to magically produce Paper. uh, writing, but if you don't read. Yep. And these, I would say, even with the native English speakers, I see this a lot, because scientific writing is a different type of writing. So if you don't read, then yep. then it's hard to 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 produce good. You have to keep up your, your yeah. skills. Yeah. 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 And be open for criticism. So I'm not an international mentee, but I remember this was during my fellowship. I was writing a paper, and uh, he, he was he was from Brazil. He was Brazilian. And he looked at it and he changed a whole, a whole bunch of things in it. And he said, now, I'm Brazilian. My first language is Portuguese. But I feel like I write a lot better than a lot of you American, <laughs> than a lot of you American <laughs> graduated <laughs> physicians. And I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll take your I'll feedback. Take I'm the trainee. Just tell me what I need to yeah. do to get better. So Ooh, yeah, that's another good practice, point. Practice, practice, I practice. used to have, even this I did a lot. So my first year in grad school, Everything I wrote, no matter what it was for, I would have an American friend read it for me. Mm -hmm. And he'd be like, I get it, it's, it's clear. I, I was like, no, 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 correct, correct <laughs> everything. Like, I want it to be correct, <laughs> not, I don't want you to get it. Right, right, <laughs> right. And that was really helpful too, to improve my, my English skills. One of the awesome things that my graduate advisor did, she had like writing groups for all of her mentees. Yeah, that's and good. you know, she always would tell us, um, write for the ear, not for, you know, reading. So, you know, we would be in that group and it would be my turn to read what I wrote, just two pages, right? So everybody is just listening because like writing for the ear is much more difficult because you have to make everything like flow and simple. But here is the thing, you know, everybody has to understand what I am saying, not like wait and think, oh, what did she mean by that? Because when somebody listening just stops to think, what do you mean by that? That there's something in the writing that has to be changed. Yeah. So these writing groups help tremendously. First of all, it makes you accountable because you have to have something ready for the group right. To, right. to present. Uh, but also you get feedback not only from people who are very intimate with the topic that you're you're writing so you know if you get your point across that means that the writing is really good so participating in these in these writing groups or creating your own has also been very beneficial for me excellent excellent so if you're just joining us uh, thank you for tuning in to this live Facebook Q&A um, I'm Dr. Melissa Yim at the Office of Research on Women's Health here with Drs. Um, Shereen El Tuki, uh, Doc um, Yaramar Kaskio, and uh, uh, Sadana Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we had a great conversation about um, mentorship and biomedical and STEM careers. Um, 
We are getting ready to wrap up though, so um, I'm going to ask each of you to leave us with um, any words of inspiration, final thoughts on mentorship or other resources you'd like to point our viewers to, um, and, 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 and you know, keep it geared towards those who are, who are really trying to um, navigate their way through science right now or even trying to find um, a good mentor. So I'm going to start. Sure, sure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would say my very first mentors were my family, my mom and my dad. So my mom is a social worker. My dad is a computer scientist. And they always taught me to just go for it, to keep persisting on, despite microaggressions, despite all the noise of what we can call it. Um, and then my second set of mentors were my sisters. So I have two older sisters. And again, they taught me, keep going despite the noise, despite anything else. So I feel like that is a big tool that I've utilized in my <clears throat> 20 some years of being on this earth, right? <laughs> that's what I'm gonna say today. Um, uh, that's, a, th that's what continues to push me forward as a mentor and a mentee, to just continue to push, be persistent, be assertive, um, be bold, um, and be an awesome, audacious uh, listener um, to be on top of things and to be diligent. Um, the biggest thing is to just remain focused because what can happen a lot in the scientific field and really many multiple other fields is that we start to compare ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. what is he doing over there? What is she What is she getting? What is he getting? And that does help us to continue to be diligent and to stay on task, but it also uh, allows us to cower a little bit because we're like, well, how come I'm not getting that? You know, so jealousy. and mm -hmm. So really, mm -hmm. you stay focused. Be persistent. Be audacious. Be bold. Um, and just continue to shine. Um, then it really just keeps you in line of what you need to do and to be the best person that you can be. So that's my take. <laughs> all right. Go ahead. Me? Is ready? <laughs> um, yes, to all that. Um, I think to me, this is um, like Michelle Obama says, right? Like when they go low, you, go you gotta go high. Yeah. And I think that that has been extremely important to me to stay true to my beliefs, to stay true to what I am and my standards. You know, the noise is going to be there. You're going to see what, the, what, what other people are doing and how that affects you. But I think that in order to stay focused on the prize and get to where you want to be, you, you definitely need to stay true to what you believe in. I think it's really easy to see, to go down in a very dark, ugly path if you're trying to, to just get back at people that, that are hurting you or are not treating you the way that you think you should be treated. And I think that, that just being true to, to, to your standards and your, um, uh, values I think you know at the personal level at the scientific level at the professional level but also again I cannot emphasize more communicating you know we don't have to be victims if you are in a bad place for whatever reason there's always going to be someone that cares and will be there to help you mm -hmm. so don't give up on what you want to do but don't feel that you have to be like accepting poor, poor treatments or, or just things that are not acceptable, period. Um, just speak up and identify who are your allies and how they can help you get to where you want to be in a positive, nurturing, inclusive environment. You don't have to put up with, with anything. You know, just because we are underrepresented, it shouldn't be that you just have to take it. You know, I know a lot of us here, uh, here that we have to work harder. Working harder is okay, but you don't have to be accepting mistreatments. And I think that that's the one thing I would say is don't quit, stay high, but respect yourself and make sure that people respect you. Well, I would, I would say um, 
remember how awesome you are. You're already here. You already have a, a career or on the path to having a full-blown career in, in, in research and in STEM. So you're already here. You are you're good. So um, just stay positive. Keep your eyes on the prize. Remember that a mentor-mentee relationship is a two-way street. So again, communicate and you know try and find um, different mentors who will kind of satisfy your uh, needs wherever you are in your career because that changes over your the, the life course of your career just have you know positive people surrounding you peers um, you know senior mentors um, whatever it takes to get you through and remember um, at the end of the day, it always works out. I mean, I mean, no matter how um, um, sometimes it, it would be like a bad situation, but you know, from experience, you know, it has certainly worked out for me and for everybody here. So just just keep your eyes on the price and just keep pushing through, and it will it will work out. So and and just remember how awesome you are. So thank you for for those you. great. <laughs> <laughs> parting words. Um, so thanks again for tuning in to this discussion brought to you by the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health. Um, if we were unable to get to your questions, we'll have our panelists answer them. Um, if uh, you can post them on the Facebook and uh, Twitter pages throughout March. Uh, if you'd like more information about NIH mentoring programs, grant opportunities, or to learn more about the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, please visit nih.gov forward slash women. Um, and I'm sure that um, you can reach out to these wonderful NIH yes, please. scientists, please. women scientists, um, for any uh, follow-up questions as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the audience. <laughs>